Howdy, y'all. I'm Thomas Carpenter. I'm one of the student leaders for our civics club. Uh, basically, our civics club seeks to help our students understand how local government works. That is the focus, and we uh, want to have a better understanding of how, uh, how it works and how a uh, citizen can be involved. And with that, this is the Civics Club first time hosting the candidate forum uh, because the, this is our second year with the Civics Club being around, uh, and we're we're proud to proud to be doing that. So I'll be moderating, along with our four student panelists, which will be Eleanor Story, Emily Kapusak, Adam Strickler, and Graham Burns. So here's how things will be proceeding. I, first, we will do the mayoral candidates, and you'll have two minutes to introduce yourselves, and then we will have five minutes uh, of questions. After that will be the counselors and the same uh, time frame, two minutes for introductions and five minutes for questions. There's a lot of y'all, so we'll be you know, uh, fairly strict with the timing on that. Uh, our other student club leader, Pierce Christensen, is the timekeeper right here. Uh, he'll be holding up the green card for go, the yellow card will be 30 seconds left, and the red card will be 10 seconds left. And then I will call stop when time is up. So with that, I'd like to invite up our first uh, candidate, Mr. Art Becky. Does my time start now? Yes, sir. Thank you. Yeah, I'm Art Betke, and I'm one of the candidates for mayor's position here in Moscow this go-round. This is my third trip up here to a disputatio. I've been up here twice before as a city council candidate. And with those eight years in city council, having been fortunate enough to have been elected twice over, I also have 10 years as the chairman of planning and zoning commission prior to that. So my government experience goes quite deep. One of the comments that our moderator made was that uh, you're here to understand a little bit more about civic government. So I'll talk a little bit about that from the mayoral point of view. Uh, Moscow is defined in Idaho as a municipal corporation. And like all corporations, it's structured much the same. The mayor fills the role of CEO, which means the mayor implements the will, the policy, using the funding provided by what amounts to the board of directors, which is the city council. So the mayor himself does not do all the policy setting within the city. The mayor merely implements all of the policies and direction articulated by the council. So with all of that, uh, it's not as sexy as a position as you might think that it is. Uh, you're juggling a lot of things, but you also have to keep an eye on what's going on with our partner entities hereabouts, which are the two counties, uh, Leita and Whitman, what's going on with Pullman, what's going on with the state and the state legislature. So the mayor has to have a finger in all of these, and with my experience in the past, I'm well suited to this position, having anchors in all of those entities, as well as the state. Uh, so. Of all, I think I do a pretty good job with that. All righty. Uh, thank you very much. We'll we'll go through and introduce uh, each, and then we'll call you up for the uh, gotcha. questions. Uh, so with that, uh, the next mayoral candidate is Mr. Jim Gray. Well, good afternoon. You might think that uh, Art is the senior member of the uh, cadre, but his, that hair thing is fake. <laughs> I'm by far the senior member of this whole group. A <laughs> um, little bit about myself. Um, I'm, I was born and raised in Texas. I, um, uh, when, I finished, when I finished high school, I uh, entered the Coast Guard. Now, there are those that think the Coast Guard is a, uh, 
American or United States coastal body of uh, protection, but it's overseas as well. I went to avoid the, uh, I guess you could say, the, the involuntary entry into the Army because I didn't want to go to Vietnam. <laughs> I joined, when I joined the Coast Guard, finished my basic training, that's where I was, in Vietnam. <laughs> and so I've learned one thing, if nothing else, um, whatever is supposed to happen is going to happen. I, um, after I retired out of the Coast Guard, I retired in, um, in Missouri. And um, after retiring there, I went um, back to university and finished, got my teaching certificate. Okay, yellow card. All right. <laughs> and um, I have, my wife is um, Pullman native, and now you can figure out why I'm back here. <laughs> and... Um, we have, between the two of us, we have 12 children. Oh, don't worry, they're all adults now. But anyway, I, I guess I got my red card, so I guess I better go. <laughs> and the last mayoral candidate we have here will be Miss Barb Rathbun. The last. All right, well, I'm old school Idaho, and I was born and raised here, and uh, so you think for yourself, and you don't trust government, and you leave people alone, and you mind your own business. And unfortunately, this is an attitude that's been mocked a lot recently, but it made the free society that everybody has been fleeing to as of recent. We have so many Californians and Washingtonians and uh, Western Oregonians who have fled here looking for freedom. And unfortunately, uh, we're having the same issues that they are fleeing from. So we need to stand up and fight for our community again. Um, uh, I want to get us back to a community government that serves the residents and isn't looking to profit off of the community. And so I'll keep it short and sweet. I'll end with that. Hello, hello. All right, if Mr. Art Becky could come uh, back up to the stage, and we will start the questioning. <laughs> like your aerobics, <laughs> up and down, <laughs> back and forth. So. <laughs> All right. On your website, you've emphasized both economic resilience and a need to implement a plan to mitigate the drawdown on the aquifer. In previous forums, you've also mentioned the expenses associated with the proposed solutions to the aquifer situation. How would you propose handling this problem in a manner that takes fiscal responsibility into account as well? What sorts of solutions would you consider? Okay, fiscal responsibility is something that has a temporal aspect as well. Is it fiscally uh, small initially, or is it fiscally responsible in the long run? If Moscow runs out of water, that is not fiscally responsible because we're all, well, dead in the non-existent water. So there has to be an investment made, and we need to do the investment now because it's gonna be a decades-long project securing alternative water sources. The aquifer continues to go down. From my understanding, we've still got another 100, 200 years worth of water down there. No reason not to get ahead of it now while the costs are not gonna be as high as they will be in 10 or 20 years. Uh, the Palouse Basin Aquifer Committee has proposed four different options. Two of them involve the state of Washington, which means their water rights law, which I would really want to steer clear of. Two of them involve Idaho. And the winner of it, which affords Moscow the ability to have 100% of its water replaced, is dam up Flanagan Creek on the north side of Moscow Mountain, pipe the water up and over, and use it here after that. And that runs probably about $75 million. Hence, we need to start looking for other funding sources, grants, which means bringing in anybody we can. The Idaho Department of Water Resources is one good example 
about a partner entity we could rely on for some funding. Thank you. And uh, next, based on your experience serving on the city council, what would you say is an issue that the city of Moscow has been avoiding or putting off addressing? That turns into a bit of a matter of perception because sometimes it seems like there's issues out there that we're not addressing fully. And it isn't really so. There's a lot of capital improvement plans present that prioritize and sequence up um, activities, uh, capital improvements that need to be done. So even though something's not happening right now, it doesn't mean that it's not gonna happen in the future. We have a lot of needs and a lot of it is wicked expensive. Uh, EPA might have us putting in a water chiller out at the wastewater treatment plant to cool Paradise Creek down by two degrees, and that's gonna cost several million dollars. Why? Paradise Creek is not gonna stay cool in August for more than the time it takes to get to Toyota. And then you're right back where you start. So some of these things we have to plan for, put money into, uh, we have to buy fire engines, they're $500,000 a pop. The ladder truck's 1.6 million. We need to keep replacing these things. So uh, this and other issues, although not immediately evident, are still on the burner. Thank you. And uh, next, you state on your website that providing water, sewer, sanitation, streets, transportation, fire, police, parks, and arts are the fundamentals of municipal government. Moscow is known as the heart of the arts. What particularly about art do you believe is a fundamental of city government? And how are you planning on adhering to that fundamental as mayor? Good one. We can put lots and lots of money into infrastructure, and we do. Eventually, we come to a point where we look like every other municipality in the United States. What sets us apart? What we have that sets us apart and makes us unique is the art scene. We've got the farmer's market. We have Art Walk. Uh, we've just implemented an entertainment district, which is essentially a limited case-by-case -case basis for open container on the main street of Moscow. These are all arts projects that we're involved with, uh, rendezvous in the park, um, all kinds of artsy things that go on here that give Moscow character, that give us our unique and somewhat quirky sense of place that a lot of other municipalities wish they had too. And so we have to maintain that as part of our overall city structure. All right, and finally, looking back on your years spent on city politics, are there any decisions made by the city council in the past that you would change? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> um, one of them uh, has to do with uh, hiring consultants for touchy-feely things, like there was a a new cities initiative a few years ago that could go. And the one that most immediately leaps to mind is the topless car wash issue, which was beyond ridiculous. <laughs> you, you are so strict. <laughs> so, okay, thank you. Thank you very much. Alrighty, if Mr. Jim Gray could join us back up on the stage. So that's you with the smiley face. Good afternoon, Mr. Gray. Good afternoon. Uh, on your website, you wrote that serving in the Coast Guard taught you how to be a mediator in tense cases. What are tensions you see in the political scene in Moscow, and how would you resolve them? Well, as a mediator, you're, you facilitate uh, settlements between uh, disputing parties. And then after you get the settlement, then you try to encourage um, direction uh, because you are the person that's kind of kind of like the referee, but you also interact with the individuals or groups to um, keep the situation settled. Now, uh, what I uh, have an issue with is for, in the city is what I call selective respect and. For those of you who are not familiar, selective respect is, is that which can destroy a city, uh, destroy a family. And that in and of itself is something we need to avoid. That selective respect is no um, 
respecter of sex, uh, race, uh, religion, and it knows no party. And the thing that it actually does is mimic, uh, it, 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 it uses hate and it, and it uses it and makes it seem like self-righteousness. Now, that's one of the things that, those are the things that I, I see that's happening. Now, what I'll see to correct it is, I like the idea of block parties. Yes, I do. And I would have block parties, block parties around the city. And it's not, wouldn't be just for the block that, that it would be designated for me, for anyone that wants to attend. Now, my thing is to get people to actually start talking with each other, start interacting with each other, start doing things together, maybe, maybe even uh, uh, invite each other over to home games, home to interact with whatever. You also wrote that you would like to focus on business growth, sustaining established businesses, and bringing new businesses to our community. As Moscow expands, what policies or practices do you think the city council ought to and if any, ought not to adopt in promoting business growth? Business growth is, uh, should be, um, we need to be more business friendly, which is not the case in my experience of being here. And we also need to look at, review the zoning of the uh, town to um, see where residential areas and business could, re, could, be, could be, are separated or reside together. Now, Communities, the input, families and, and, and the community should be, should be inputted, should be in, should input into the decisions of the city so that the, uh, the, um, and that is family friendly, it will, uh, uh, lost my train of thought, I'm sorry. We have to um, create um, communication between the city and the community whereby to address the business issue because we need to bring business into the community that is family friendly. And we need to also take in consideration here in the next few years, next few months, that that is going to happen, which is already occurring, which is a high inflation, um, shortages, and problems in the supply chain. We, those need to be addressed as well. Thank you. And you say on your website that you are pro-family as part of your platform as you have just mentioned quite a bit. If elected, how do you see this value as featuring in your tenure as mayor? Well, family should be, um, <laughs> okay, family should be the, uh, the core of, uh, of, uh, of everything that's done in the city. Decisions that the uh, city council makes, um, bringing, like say, bay, oh, that's, <laughs> okay. The red, red is 10 seconds left. Now you start. <laughs> okay. Um, and I'm a, I, don't, I do not like the idea of the, whoops, the uh, open container situation. I would do away with that. And uh, because I do not see Moscow as an open party. Thank you. Thank you. And finally, for our mayoral candidates, we'd like to ask Barb Brathman back up to the stage. Thank you for coming out. In your campaign advertisements, you say government should empower individual responsibility, not dependence on government. What are some policies you would either support or oppose as an application of this principle? Well, I'd like to see 
the individual will be empowered again and not be put into government dependence so much. So I'd be trying to get get it easier to start small businesses and um, uh, the other one slipped my mind, unfortunately. But I would I would like to uh, get get it back where the individual gets to make decisions for themselves and and. Uh, I think that a lot of the government dependence actually takes our freedom away from us, so. And you mentioned in your campaign that you want to get to the bottom of the mismanagement of our tax money. How do you believe the city has mismanaged taxes in the past, and how would you seek to resolve this? Well, um, our police department, it was my understanding from the mayor himself, was supposed to have a jail in it. And it cost us, as I understood it, $9 million was what, what I thought we were voting on, uh, though I've heard a few different numbers now. Um, but apparently it has no jail in it, so why did we need the new building? And um, we, about a dozen years ago, we had our taxes, our monthly taxes increased from $50 to $70, and I was told that that was to pay for a a uh, water reservoir off of Moscow Mountain. And that water reservoir never went in. And now here we're looking at, uh, I've heard 20 to $100 million in an alternate water source. So my faith in my municipal corporate government is, is kind of at its end. And you've mentioned your desire to reclaim our community government for the residents. What do you mean specifically by reclamation? And what actions would you support this mayor to accomplish this? Well, right now, you don't have to look too hard to hear the uh, city council and mayor talking about profiting off the community, profiting off the residents, seeing our community as and our residents as um, something other than human beings, uh, like a number, like we're, like we're a commodity now. We're just, being, we're just here to be ordered around and we need to shut up in a bay. And I'm not a big fan of that kind of mentality. So I would be definitely empowering uh, individual responsibility and your individual decisions and you own your family and you own your life and, and it should be easier to live, um, so. If that answers your question. <laughs> yep. And uh, when it comes to using taxpayer dollars wisely, can you give an example of something that the city is currently overspending on? And is there any area in which you would invest less tax money than is being currently spent? Well, I want to get into the budget um, because right now we have a lot of, uh, the cost of living is is high and we have a lot of economic issues that are coming at us. We're not really sure exactly how this is going to impact us, but definitely we need to start worrying about our ability to pay our bills and survive comfortably. And uh, the city in the last fee uh, meeting that they had paid no mind to the impact on the residents and what these fee increases were gonna do. And mostly, if you watch their city council meetings, mostly they're, that's how they're talking. It's like, we don't care about the residents. We don't care about how hard it is to live. We're not, we're not gonna cut our budget. We're not gonna uh, sacrifice our, our, what is it, our golden cow, the uh, arts or uh, anything is everything is everything in city is more important than the residents and I don't I think it's I think that's upside down the residents are more important all right thank you do you have any closing comments um I do but I'll keep them to myself <laughs> Thank you very much for the mayoral candidates. Uh, we're now going to move to our city councilor candidates. Uh, and first up, uh, we'd like to invite up Gina Trusco. That's an agility course. 
right there. Um, thank you, and I want you all to say with me, Terusio. Terusio. Thank you. <laughs> also, how many of you are old enough to vote? Put your hands up. Okay. I bet I know what you're doing the next, what, November 2nd? Okay. My name is Gina Terusio. I uh, arrived here 27 years ago, plus or minus, with two dogs, two cats, and two children coming over the hill in my Dodge Neon, right? I thought, I'm going to go to law school, and I'm going to leave. Here I am. <laughs> um, I have two Vandal graduates. I am a Vandal graduate as well. I've fallen in love with our community. I got to a certain point in my life, started just about the same time that my hair turned the same color as Art's, um, that I realized that you can't throw rocks at things that are happening if you're not willing to work to change them, okay? So that was the beginning of my understanding that, oh, here's a bigger responsibility now. I was lucky and honored to be appointed to the first year and a half of my council tenure. I decided then I still wasn't done with the work that I wanted to do for our city. There's just so much to be done. And again, I'm here uh, asking for your vote and hoping to continue the good work that we've begun. Okay? Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Uh, next will be Haley Lewis. Triply did not plan my shoes accordingly for the day with the rain and the stairs, so we're gonna hope for the best. Uh, hello, my name is Haley Lewis. Um, I grew up here in Moscow, born and raised. Uh, my mom's a teacher at the middle school. I made some friends. How many students went to Logos? Rad. I made some really great friends uh, through the Junior Miss program back in high school at Logos, and we would uh, come for McDonald's and have lunch at Logos and. The dances that we were invited to were always more fun than the Moscow High School dances, to be honest. Uh, and I love this space. I, I used to come to CJ's for a country swing dance, so it's uh, nice to see it in the daylight and a little less stinky and more clean. Um, so <laughs> anyway, uh, so I grew up here. I chose to stay for the University of Idaho. Uh, I studied international studies in Spanish. I have always said I wanted to change the world. I told that to a Pulitzer Prize winning journalist and um, a neurosurgeon and they said, okay, and that's that's not good enough. In, es in essence saying that's a really big goal, how are you gonna do it? And I said, oh shoot, I should think about that. So what I learned from that and what I learned from studying international studies is the best place to impact, to have uh, the most direct impact is to start close to home. There's lots and lots to do in your hometown and your communities. Uh, and so I, in, by my day job, I'm a policy analyst. I analyze Washington and Idaho policy for Schweitzer Engineering Laboratories in Pullman. I've been there for nine years. I love it. Uh, and uh, I have a knack for policy. I've always kind of been drawn to it. And I'm really excited for the opportunity to give back to my community. I had a few uh, friends and neighbors approach me to consider running. So here I am, uh, and I look forward to your questions. Thank you. Uh, next will be Melissa Klein. It looks like last minute she was not able to make it. Um, okay, next will be Steve Harmon. Thank you, and thank you to the uh, civics team and uh, all you guys participating here. Um, it is a true pleasure to be here and actually speak on this microphone. Sometimes I'm able to worship here in this building, and so uh, I'm standing in the feet of giants here. So um, I am really excited to be able to um, run for city council. I tried momentarily a couple years ago and saw that there was some greater um, uh, people running than I, than I, and I also wanted to have some more experience in town and decided to back out. But after that and kind of seeing how the last race went, I am extra um, uh, excited to be able to, um, to run. Uh, the reason that uh, my family and I moved out here about five years ago was to kind of flee Portland, Oregon after it became sort of a uh, cesspool of identity politics. 
And uh, the fun that was being in a diverse town faded very fast, unfortunately. And so I wanted to go out somewhere else, somewhere where I was comfortable with, which is um, the Palouse. I'm a graduate of Washington State University, class of 99 in broadcast communication. And um, I was familiar with the schools and some of the people out here. And uh, so we, uh, in 2016, moved out here. And I own a small, a uh, couple small businesses, actually. I own Troy Motors out in Troy, Idaho. I own the timber, own the timber mill, which is now going to be run by somebody else, maybe in this room. And um, I've got a, another small electronics company called Synthrotech, and we uh, manufacture uh, small electronics, audio electronics, and that's about it as far as for my, um, my work experience. I'm hoping to be able to take uh, my practicality in running a small business and bring it to um, our town. Mr. Harmon. Uh, lastly will be Mr. Kirk Taylor. If you're not as tall as him, I doubt you're as tall as me. <laughs> um, so nice to meet all of you. My name is Kirk, like Captain Kirk from Star Trek. I always like to introduce myself like that. It's an easy way to remember me. Um, I'm married, I have a wife and two kids, a little boy, he's just born born, his name is William, and a little girl named Claire. Um, I got my bachelor's degree from BYU-Idaho in healthcare administration, and my master's degree from health policy and in, in health policy and administration from Washington State University. And uh, I work at Pullman Regional Hospital and Human Resources as a senior HR generalist. Um, I love this community, although I'm newer to the community, I've met a lot of really great people, a lot of great families, and I'm, I'm eager to get involved. Um, I'm, I'm excited about um, the, the changes that we can, we can make as a community together. Um, I've, I'm really going to be advocating for uh, involvement with our community. I'd love to see just more transparency and more communication. Um, and so I hope that I can and, and do that through various channels, whether that be through social media or um, the radio, you, you name it. Um, but we can work together, and I think as a collaborative mind, we can make uh, some really important decisions that will uh, benefit us. Uh, in 2018, this community was uh, labeled as a, one of the best places to raise a family, and I would love to keep it that way. Um, uh, let's see. I, I, I'm excited to talk to you more. I, you know, I, and I, I'll even stay a little bit after to have some cookies because they look really good, and um, <laughs> and talk to you about any questions that you have. And I'm a nice guy, so um, <laughs> look forward to talking with you. Thank you. Thank you. All righty. With that, let's get going with uh, Gina. <laughs> Is there some science to this that I'm not aware of? Oh, wait a minute. Okay, I'm a rock star now, aren't I? <laughs> Okay, my first question for you is, on your website, you highlight the topic of division, saying, for far too long, we've been indulging in rampant hate and selective respect. We need to face reality and press the reset button on what it means to be neighborly. Within the sphere of local government, what practical, everyday steps will you take to heal this division? Do y'all see my soapbox? I'm going to jump on it here for a minute, and then I will step off. <laughs> first and foremost, the list that our fine gentleman had earlier of the fundamental city services does not include healing division. I think it's incumbent upon us, however, as leaders, to speak out against what has just been rampant intolerance and hate, some of it aimed squarely at your young faces. I think it's important for us as leaders to call it out Haley said earlier, and I, it seems like the 30th forum we were speaking at this past week, but basically speaking the issue, making it real out loud, and trying to find a solution. So I'm going to step off the soapbox now. You asked for real life, everyday things. I am going to continue to be in the community, seen in the community, be available for people to talk to. I'm going to institute what I call office hours. Um, 
which by which I will be two hours anywhere once a week. And anybody and everybody can come talk to me. I don't care what the agenda is. I won't screen one way or the other. And I'm going to be in different places. So if you don't want to go to one place, you can, we can meet in another. I think I will continue to create the ways for people to be heard. That's so important in our government right now because really government is best right next to you. And so your ability to feel included and have your voices heard is probably number one job for us community leaders. I'm building a coalition. If you go out to ginaformosco.com, get yourself signed up. I will help. I'll help you know when those public hearings are that you want to be part of. I will help you know the issues that are coming before council. You can also help me know the things that are important to you that I can bring back to the back to the ranch. Thank you. You also say on your website that you believe the government's role is to provide for the people those critical functions which individuals or private organizations cannot perform. In your opinion, what are some specific examples of those critical functions which local government ought to provide and that private individuals or organizations cannot perform? I'm pretty sure we all know this list, right? Water, sewer, pick up the garbage, fire protection, police, that sort of thing. How's that for quick and deadly? <laughs> you, were all, you were all going at the same time, weren't you? <laughs> that, that was great. Um, <laughs> you also state on your website that you have a maturing vision to provide leadership on the issues facing our city. How has your vision for the city changed over your years serving as a city council member, and how specifically will your maturing vision serve the community? So I think what I've, what's been made very clear to me is kind of, again, a little bit of what Haley said in that I thought I was going to change the world too. And it's not one of us that does it. It's all of us that do it. And it's six of us that get to vote on the issues, right? So my understanding of the, the, the collaboration and the family, the community that goes into decision making and making things move forward for the community has really expanded. So that brings me my desire to do the coalition, to bring government from, I don't think it's been far away from the community, but we've had a little bit of a divide these last, what, 20 months with, with COVID. It's time to bring it back to where it's, it's accessible and, and we're gonna collaborate and find the issues. We're gonna have a water, a humongous water project coming up in the next two years. $70 million, right? I need to hear what your thoughts are on that. So I want to bring it to the point where, where government is part of your daily, what does the yellow mean again? 30 seconds. I just want to, I, I want to bring it back to where you're engaged in the process of government, right? Engagement doesn't, however, mean buy-in. But it may mean that we have to agree to disagree and we're going to build respect into that equation. We're not going to have this name calling and mask makes people look different and all of these things. This is that 10 seconds. This is the kind of the rules of order. We're going to be respectful and we're going to bring government back to you. Thank you very much. <laughs> is that all? Thanks, guys. All right, if Haley Lewis would be able to join us up here on the stage. Hi, you mentioned on your campaign website that one of your priorities is allocating taxpayer dollars efficiently while balancing the need to make critical investments in our city's future. Can you give an example of something that Moscow is currently spending its money on that is an inefficient use of taxpayer dollars or something that the city ought to spend money on as an efficient use of tax dollars? So to clarify, my purpose of stating that on the website is I, I want people to know that I am uh, economically minded and I know that uh, many of the wish list items that a community member may approach me for either may not fall into the role of municipal government or are gonna be expensive. So to clarify, uh, I actually think the city's doing a pretty dang good job being mindful of um, taxpayer dollars and balancing accordingly. You add in the conversation with state and, and federal, it, it kind of can, it changes. Um, so two things that come to mind, and one is a little nebulous and isn't totally, uh, 
within con the control of the city, uh, a lot of the expense for having city employees is actually tied to their benefits. Um, most companies you're going to see that they're providing benefits is going to be one of their largest expenses behind operating expenses. And so one thing that I do in my day job is I research healthcare price transparency. Um, so I'll just, I'll shelf that. I'm happy to talk a little bit more about that after. Um, but we spend a lot of money to make sure that our city employees have benefits, which we sh absolutely should do, but are there creative solutions or vendors that we can be looking at to partner with private to make sure that our public do dollars are uh, being spent efficiently. But the other thing I was gonna say is um, there's like a $600,000 line item expense, I think six, $630,000 uh, earmarked for WITCOM. So WITCOM is our emergency services dispatch. And so it's, it's a, it's, we partner with Pullman, we partner with Whitman County, and there's a lot of stakeholders. Um, and they've had some trouble in the past few years as far as making sure that their budget is uh, uh, in control and also that they, they have retention issues. So I want to take a closer look at WITCOM to make sure that we're giving them what makes sense for support um, and also making sure that we're paying our fair share with our other partners. Great, thank you so much. Um, also on your website, you wrote that one of your priorities is to think creatively about how to ensure Moscow has adequate, affordable, and attainable housing for its population. What are some policies you want to implement to alleviate our current housing problem? Affordable housing is more than just government-driven policymaking, and also it's uh, it, it's not necessarily the goal of or the role of government to to, own, to fix housing. It is a community problem, and so that's where it bleeds into the government space. Right? There's things that the city has control over as far as zoning and codes. I think what creative solutions. Um, I don't think that the city needs to be whining and dining. Uh, Developers, I don't think that's appropriate. I do think that if we can make a city environment with uh, you know, really drawing attention to having um, a low threshold for development costs and you know streamlined review process and permitting, that's a really appealable way to do um, to, to to draw attention to our our city. And but the other one that comes to mind is in the affordable housing study that uh, Pep led with points. And he wasn't points consulting then. Mm. T.P. Miller and Associates with Brian Points as lead, uh, one of the things that was interesting to me is they laid out minimum lot size for single family residences and Pullman's is 9,000 square feet and Moscow's right now for I think R1 is six, or I've got it backwards. Moscow's is 9,000, Pullman is 6,000 square feet. And so there's some things we can be doing and calling attention to to help draw uh, developers in, but I don't think we need to be going and um, soliciting developers. That's not the right place for the city to be spending its energy. What would you say is an issue that the city of Moscow has been avoiding or putting off addressing? I have two. One being, I, I think the city's been really good at staying hip with the times in a lot in regards to a lot of things. Um, one area though, and Gina kind of pointed to it, I think uh, there's room to better adapt to how people consume information uh, and communicate better the opportunities for involvement in having a say in things that, that the city has control over. Uh, so I think not a lot of people really want to go to the board docs interface and uh, navigate in a non-flattering agenda for one or two items. And so I think there's some things we can be doing to better communicate out. Um, the other note is is water related. I think we're going to keep kicking the can down the road to solve our declining aquifer problem, and we'll, we will be, as Art said, uh, dead in the not water. So, um, I, and it's going to it's going to continue to being expensive. So we need to start taking action now. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. <laughs> All righty, if Steve Harmon could join us up here. Good afternoon, Mr. Harmon. Hello. Mr. Harmon, you've stated on your Facebook page that diversity, tolerance, and inclusion are all terms that presuppose differences between people. If we are to make a more unified city, we must accept this reality and share space with those we disagree with under the banner of liberty. How do you plan to accomplish this shared space as a Moscow City Council member? So yes, we do need unity. Um, we need shared values, love, respect, tolerance, and inclusion. 
Uh, it's a given that we live in a town where the people here are different races, uh, religions, cultures, national origins. And this is true for most cities in America. It's been that way for many, many years. So um, how can we work together to provide a better city for all of the citizens? Um, we need to have shared values, essentially. And that's something that we used to have in our country. Uh, through the reading and study of the great books of Western civilization, we used to be taught to cultivate virtue and discipline and appreciate tradition and community. We did this all under the banner of liberty for all. Liberty for individuals and groups to pursue their American dream. We didn't always like each other, but we stood together to defend our neighbor's rights. Um, our children are now taught to critique the heroes of this tradi tradition, to dismantle, destroy the very thing that provided cultural and social cohesion. Narcissism, cognitive dissonance, self-hate, hate to neighbor, and country is the result. There is no longer a shared purpose and shared identity, and the resulting is going to be ruin. So uh, we need to return to our shared American values based upon the Constitution and Bill of Rights. We need to dedicate our lives to something more healthy and greater than ourselves. We need God, family, and nation. Um, and as your councilman, how can I help? That's a big, tall order, of course. Well, we can do this by espousing these values at every turn. I like uh, what Jim said. We can have larger Fourth of July celebrations like they have in Troy, Idaho, with big fireworks that are super awesome. We don't do that here. For American flags, we can have them in more public places. We can pro just, just, just see more of America in our traditions. More citywide celebrations like Oktoberfest. I thought that was super awesome that the city did that, and I'm kind of pro um, walking around with booze if that's uh, kept in order. Um, and uh, we need to call on our social institutions, uh, all of our social institutions, all our clubs, churches, to involve themselves in things like that, not just select businesses. We want to make that citywide. We need Christmas fairs, Columbus Day celebrations, and so on. The city should promote civic engagement, transparent meetings, uh, not private meetings, um, and charitable outreach to those who are suffering. Gross individualism and communism should be condemned with the highest fury. And we're Americans, and we better start acting like it. And this said, expressions of art, food fairs, festivals will never be enough. We must start com commit ourselves to something greater than ourselves and not to the empty pursuits of self-expression. A city council member can promote these values but cannot force a change like this. Only civic-minded people, like you guys, of all ages can do this by loving our neighbor and city more fully. It's gonna take work and it'll take repair and it'll take courage because people don't want to hear that right now always. It's not gonna happen by itself and it only happened by the grace of God through a moral and religious people. Um, and you know, of course, the John Adams quote, which is our constitution was made only for a moral and religious people. It is wholly inadequate to the government of any other. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Harmon, you have expressed a fair amount of disdain for masks and mass mandates in the city of Moscow. What is your foundation for these beliefs, and how do you plan on winning the favor of the community when it comes to your proposed policies against mass mandates? Okay, so uh, I strongly believe that masks do not work to control a viral pandemic, um, and it's shown by many studies, which I could go on more than I need to, but um, we see that the CDC website concludes one of its studies by saying we did not find any evidence that surgical type face masks are effective in reducing laboratory confirmed influenza. COVID is a form of influenza, either when worn by infected people or persons in the general community to reduce their susceptibility. A uh, recent uh, WHO paper entitled Advice on the Use of Masks in the Context of COVID-19 States, at the present time, the widespread use of masks by healthy people in the community setting is not yet supported by high quality or direct scientific evidence. And um, on and on, uh, don't exercise while you're wearing a mask because we're not supposed to. We know that um, uh, that'll increase your bacterial load, which Fauci said actually caused the Spanish flu deaths. That's it. <laughs> Sorry, I got a lot more. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Eric. Thank you very much. All righty, and if Mr. Kirk Taylor could come join us at the stage. I'm ready. Let's All do right. it. Mr. Taylor, you have stated that you understand the importance of safeguarding the elderly and immunocompromised through vaccination. 
but you also recognize the importance of allowing citizens to make their own decisions in this matter. In light of this, and given your healthcare experience, what measures would you propose to protect the elderly and immunocompromised in our community? Thank you. It's a very important decision that a lot of people have to make, but I would, I would encourage vaccination. I know that these vaccines have been proven to be safe and effective, um, <clears throat> and they can pre reduce the severity of illness um, when, when we get COVID-19. It, it won't actually prevent necessarily from getting COVID-19, but it can reduce the severity of illness. Um, a lot of times, if you look out right now, you look at the hospitals, a lot of our beds are limited or our, our capacity to hold patients is limited because of COVID patients. And we're finding that a lot of those folks who are hospitalized haven't been vaccinated. So something that I would just continue to advocate for is vaccination. Um, I had someone ask me a question about what do you think about other vaccinations, such as like an MMR or you know, mumps, measles, and rubella and that stuff. And I'm, I'm pro-vaccination across the board for what most physicians have agreed on is, is important. Um, and then I would, I would just to suggest that if you're elderly or immunocompromised, um, just to be careful um, and to let uh, citizens to make decisions themselves as to what they feel is the best to protect their health um, while keeping in mind that I am pro-vaccination. Thank you. You've also stated that one of your priorities with your campaign is to make sure that Moscow stays family focused. What do you think are the greatest roadblocks to a family focused environment in our city? And how do you plan to combat these issues while in office? Thank you, it's a great question. Um, right now we're having a hiring crisis in our nation. Um, and I think that's, that's definitely a family roadblock because if there aren't people to work, then businesses can't thrive and revenue doesn't happen. Um, and so I think that we need to do what we can to try and encourage people to get out and to work in a, in a healthy and sustainable way. We need to recruit people to continue to grow businesses. Um, that revenue is very important. There's a, there's a fiscal health to a community that needs to continue to be vibrant and, and running so that our families can grow up in a healthy, um, safe environment. I, I love Moscow. I think it's very safe. Um, I love that, uh, you know, it's not uncommon to see someone have their car running and they run inside for a couple minutes and do something and you won't see that somewhere else. That's totally weird and say like, <laughs> I've lived in Portland and I've lived in, um, you know, Seattle and it, it's just not, not seen there. And I want to keep those things there. I think we can continue to advocate for uh, supporting the local drug court. Um, our parks and recreation are, are awesome. We have like over 17 parks in Moscow or something are, and growing. And it's, it's incredible how many um, parks we have. And I think it's just good that we keep in mind, we're cognizant that families live here and they want to continue to live here and that we should, we should continue to allow that to happen. Thank you. Um, you have furthermore stated that you would like to find an alternative solution to our aquifers for our pressing water issues uh, in the city. How much of a priority is this for you, and what solutions do you propose? That's a great question as well, and we've already kind of discussed a little bit about that, so I don't want to repeat what some of our other um, great people have stated here. Um, but I think that the PBAC, that Palouse Basin Aquifer Committee, um, they're a good resource to go to, and we have some other resources through Idaho and Washington, potentially. Um, I'm not going to pretend that I'm an expert on this, but I, I will say that I'm, I'm, I want to make sure that we have water. It's a necessity. Um, water, shelter, those kind of things, food, they're all things that we need to continue to live. Um, and so we need to take a serious look at that. And, and from what I understand, there's been a lot of research done. So a role that I would take as a city council member would be to take the research that's already been done and disseminate that information in easy to understand terms. So that way, uh, citizens from Moscow, we can make a collective decision that doesn't cripple us financially, that leaves us looking better in the future um, and helping us to have water. So I would just say that I'm going to try my best to advocate uh, the voice of the people on that one. Yep. Sounds good. All right. So one last question, kind of a follow-up to your yeah. uh, views on vaccination. So uh, WSU just fired its head football coach, uh, Nick Rolovich, because of his refusal to receive the COVID vaccination. Yeah. Would you be in support or uh, opposed to a similar policy requiring Moscow City employees to be vaccinated or fired? Uh, and why? Uh, this is such a difficult question, and I have 10 seconds to answer it. <laughs> I, I'll just briefly, I, I wish I could just say this as quickly as possible. Uh, all right, just ask me, I guess, later on while we're having cookies. I don't know. Thank you.
All righty. Thank you so much for all the candidates coming out and any guests that we had. Thank you for coming out. Um, with that, uh, we will, uh, after we close, we'll be able to go to the little reception and we can talk a little more uh, with that. Um, so to close, I'd like to ask Dr. Erb to lead us in the singing the doxology. <laughs> 